Hillary, and I am a user experience analyst here at Usability Sciences. I've been working as a researcher for just over six years and led a, a number of studies, um, just over a hundred last count, uh, extensive methodologies, a number of different devices. Um, so we've been, do been doing this for a while. So the webinar today was prompted by a number of conversations that we've been having recently about unmoderated user testing and how that plays into user experience testing. Um, so these questions that I asked today or will display today will come directly from those conversations as well as some feedback from my clients. Um, what we'll cover today will be uh, the common questions, some of the myths associated with unmoderated user testing. Um, we'll look at what you're actually getting with unmoderated user testing so that you can set your expectations for those services, as well as what moderated user testing is and the value of that. So getting right into it, uh, the myths are the questions related to unmoderated user testing. So these were taken directly from conversations that we've had from clients recently. Uh, the first one and, you know, one that clients find most important is, you know, the cost associated with unmoderated user testing. You know, is it less expensive than traditional testing? So to set expectations, yes. Uh, dollar for dollar, unmoderated user testing is less expensive than traditional testing, but there are reasons why. Um, you really get what you pay for. So depending on the needs that you have of your research, you know, your, your costs are going to vary. Um, there are basic packages that you can pay for, but then as your needs increase and there's a, a need to get deeper into the research or to the experience, your uh, costs also increase. Question two, um, there is a question about, you know, the turnaround time for the deliverable. You know, some have asked, is it faster to just use an online service than traditional usability testing? You know, and the answer here varies. It really depends on the amount it takes for the service to collect your data, okay, and your sessions and get that back. And then the amount of time that it takes you, the client, or whoever is actually putting the data together to review those sessions, analyze the data, and then produce a report. So however long that takes you is about how as long as it's going to take for um, an unmoderated solution or service to produce your answers, okay? Um, with traditional usability testing, findings are typically uh, reported within five business days. Those are findings, your recommendations, any observations pertinent to your website or your designs. And then um, depending on the needs of the client or whoever is doing the research, there are alternative reports that you can get in less time. And then the last question, um, one that, you know, is a little bit alarming to us is, you know, can't you just replace moderated testing with unmoderated testing? And by far and large, the answer to that is no. Um, unmoderated testing can be very effective when you're researching specific questions or issues on the site. Let's say you were looking at your web analytics and there seems to be a problem on the category page. Something is happening there that's causing an issue later in the process. And you just want to wrap your mind around what's happening there. Um, it's very effective for that. Or, you know, you have, you need to get an answer or to your design team by tomorrow, by in a couple of days about something. So you just kind of need to see it happen a couple of times to kind of get a feel for what the issue is. It's perfect for that. However, unmoderated testing is not going to be able to tell the entire customer story. It's not going to be able to communicate the entire experience. Um, one of the examples that I got from my client who was explaining to me, you know, why they always come back to usability testing was it's like picking out an outfit. Um, you may pick out this shirt and it looks great in your mind and then you go to pick out these pair of pants and that looks cute by itself as well. And then you get some boots. But then you put the whole outfit together and it doesn't quite look right. And that's because you only thought about that particular item as the item and not as the full outfit. And user testing is kind of the same way. Um, when you look at specific pieces of a website, those pieces may look fine, 
But when you put the whole thing together, something is happening, something is causing confusion, and that's when you need to actually look at the entire process. So looking at unmoderated testing, um, there are some really good things about it, but um, a lot of clients suffer from going into it without really understanding what they're getting. They're not really uh, aware of some of the drawbacks to unmoderated testing. So we'll talk about a few of those here. So the backbone of good research, of any research, is you know having a good understanding of what the testing objectives are, um, being able to design a study to get at those things, and then asking the appropriate questions uh, while you're working with the participant or engaging with the participant about how things happen and why things happen. So one of the issues that our clients typically have when they go off and use the services is that, you know, they come back and we look at the research and the first question or first problem is that the questions weren't worded properly. Um, it's not done intentionally, but sometimes when you ask a question the first go around, um, you, the question may not be worded properly. It may be biased, it may be leading, um, it may be too vague or it may be too specific. So, you know, being able to word or craft those questions appropriately really makes a difference. Another issue that we've seen is that the questions appear out of sequence. It's very important not only just to ask the right questions, but ask it at the right time. Um, if you ask a question too early, now you're leading your participant to see something that they may not otherwise have. If you ask it too late, they may have forgotten what the problem was and can't give you accurate feedback about it anymore. Um, and then lastly, you know, when you write these questions and you present it on the screen, you're really leaving it up to the participant to get it. They may not understand it, they may misinterpret it, and you don't have that opportunity to fix it, you know, um, to make it clear or kind of do a redirect and get back at that information. And then as you can imagine, that leads to inaccurate and inconsistent feedback. So without these things, the feedback that you get, if you can use it at all, is gonna be very limited. So in unmoderated sessions, you know, one of the, the benefits that, you know, I mentioned earlier, being able to look at specific things um, the drawback to that is you're only limited to that scope. You're only limited to those two or three pages. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, thinking about your own work day, if I were to take out just a 15 minute block of your day, is that truly gonna represent everything that you've done? Of course not. The same is true for a user experience. In 15 minutes, you're not gonna be able to really say, you know, I think the messaging on the home page is really causing a problem here on the product detail page because you didn't look at that. So when you go into unmoderated testing, you have to realize you're looking at a very, very small part of the experience and you have to take into account that there are other things on your website attributing to that issue. Um, another thing that comes out of that is, you know, in your 15 minute session, you're gonna have people who ramble, you're gonna have people who say everything worked out great and you know they didn't. Um, you're gonna have a lot of those things and you may not, and most often than not, you're not gonna really get an understanding of why the problem happened. You may see that they're not seeing you know, the quantity selection on the product detail page, but you're not gonna understand why in that 15 minutes. Um, lastly, you know, one of the things you have to understand about unmoderated testing is that it, everything happens in past tense, okay? Um, so the sessions happen, the sessions go to the client, and then the, the client has to watch those sessions, those 15-minute sessions um, in past tense after it's already happened to get a feel for, you know, the experience or what the issue was on that page. Now. You're watching a session and maybe the user was on a great line of thinking, okay? They were explaining something, they were very articulate, it was great, but they got distracted by something else. So now their mind is on to another, another issue and you have questions about what they were talking about. Or 
if they say everything was great and their feedback is kind of surface and you want them to tell you more about that, you don't have those opportunities in unmoderated testing. You know, so once it's done, it's done. Even worst case scenario, let's say when we talked about the questions being worded improperly or we talked about, you know, you thought the issue was on this page and it turned out to be on this page, um, there aren't any redos, okay? You don't get to just say mid-session, you know what? I wish we had done this because now what you're going to have to do is set up another study. There's no redos, there's no recourse um, in that unmoderated session. So you want to prepare for that, okay? Um, as I mentioned, unmoderated testing is a very good tool. Um, it is something that usability practitioners use to, like I said, wrap your head around what the issue is. You know, if it's something major, it's something happening and you just can't figure out what the problem is, your analytics won't tell you, your customer reviews won't tell you, your complaints won't tell you, this is a good way to get in there and see what's happening, okay? So we would say unmoderated testing is best when you're short. Okay? So you're short on your budget. You only have a couple thousand dollars, you want to do something, uh, go ahead and use unmoderated testing. At the end of the day, all UX practitioners will tell you, even if it's just a little bit, make sure you test it. Okay, Test always. It's better than not testing. So even if you only have a couple thousand dollars to get this done, go ahead. We would rather you do that than not test at all. Um, you may have a short timeline. You know. I really just need to get this done by tomorrow. I just need to see what the problem is so that I can make, set up a plan to fix it or find out if it's a, it's a piece of a bigger problem. Whatever that is, you have a short timeline. This is a great tool to use. And then lastly, you're short on content. We talked about, you know, you may only have a couple of pages. It may just be something weird on your checkout page, your initial checkout page, or is something they're not seeing in the My Account page, yes, unmoderated testing is going to be able to help you out. As long as your scope is small and limited, this is going to be a great tool for you. And then most recently what we've seen is you, our clients using unmoderated testing as a way to um, highlight the benefits of moderated user testing. And the conversation kind of goes like this. Think about how much information we got from that short 15 minute video where the guy rambled for eight, eight and a half minutes. But think about how much, how much value we got out of that short session on that one page. Imagine how much more useful and valuable this user feedback would be to us if we looked at the whole thing, if we spent more time on it, if we spent the more money on it and really got into the um, the trenches with our end users about this website. If we imagine what we could do if we had that kind of feedback. So next we will go ahead and look at moderated user testing. Um, you know, some of your stakeholders are going to ask, is there value in moderated user testing? You know, if we can use unmoderated testing for these other things, is it still valuable to use moderated testing? And like I mentioned before, you know, it's the difference of picking out those individual items and they looking good on their own and putting together an outfit that looks a mess. It's the difference in, you know, picking out, I ha when I go shopping for those pants and those boots, I have this. I know what this looks like and I can put it together with this and I can put it together like this and I know how it's going to look once I walk out the door, okay? So with moderated testing, um, you're going to work with usability professionals who are trained to ask questions and extract useful feedback. Major, major, major important entity of testing and doing good research. Um, you'll work with a usability professional who's going to sit down with you and ask you questions. You know, what are your testing objectives? Who is your audience for this? What concerns do you have? Do you have any research that's already in place that's gonna that's kind of driving this work? So then the UX professional will be able to work in conjunction with the, the actual client team to set out a strategy. You don't want to just pick out a piece in the air. You want a full strategy. So the UX professional should then be able to craft unbiased 
non-leading questions to facilitate feedback. So again, going back to how you ask questions, you need to ask it the right way. It needs to be in the proper order. Um, a lot of times things come out in a usability session that nobody was expecting. So, you know, the analysts will be able to pick up on those things and run with it. You know, if there's if it's some additional issues that you didn't see coming, you want to be able to ask about that. You know, you want to be able to dig deeper because that may identify some other issues that you weren't expecting. And then lastly, a usability professional is going to be able to add to or take out questions. So, you know, if you've been in usability testing before, you know, you've gotten to your eighth or ninth or tenth user, and sometimes, you know, you've wrapped your head around a problem, you thoroughly understand the problem, but now there's some other parts that you wanted to dig into. You have that flexibility with usability testing. You don't have that necessarily with user testing. Um, you can get into, you can change gears, you can change focus, you can redirect um, as part of your research strategy. Um, moving on, the professionals customized research and the testing objectives. So this is customized to your site. So when you get ready for testing or you realize that you want to test and you sit down with a UX professional, they go through your website and they say, you know what, to really get a good feel for this, to really allow your customers to um, organically experience this, um, you're going to need more time. You're not going to be able to do it in 15 minutes. Uh, for a full website, you're probably not going to be able to do it in 30 minutes. Let's go ahead and say a 60 or 90 minute session, okay? Uh, and they, they block out that time for you. This allows the research team, that's everybody, that's your moderators, that's your clients, that's everybody, to really get into that research and let's see what's happening. Let's go in without any assumptions. Let's, let's not go in with any agendas. Let's just see what happens and give them time to really get through those issues. Let's figure out what we know is broken um, and let's figure out what we don't know what's broken and work through all of those things together. You know, at the end of the day, it's research. Um, it doesn't matter if it's unmoderated or moderated. It's research and you have to give it time. Um, you want to make sufficient time to learn what those issues are, more importantly, why those users are having the problems, and then as it comes up, um, any ideas on how to address those issues. You know, in usability testing, it, it commonly comes up, you know, I was looking at a, a checkout process a few weeks ago, and the user said, you know, this is different on, you know, site XYZ. I wish this site words like that. So then now the research team as a whole can go look at some of those other processes and see is there an opportunity to change the client website based on those other experiences. So um, one of the big things here is great usability testing happens in the moment. Um, you cannot disregard the the impact of those conversations. So the conversations between the analyst team and the client, the analyst team and the users. You cannot discount that information. Um, something very powerful happens, you know, when you sit down with a person, you just ask them why, you know? Tell me what you're thinking. Tell me how you got to this. What were your goals? What were your objectives? What were you trying to get? What task were you trying to complete? Observing them, Okay, actually watching them do whatever they intended to do, and then following up, okay, how did that work for you, okay? Um, and then pulling out those, those words and watching their actual movements and how they interact with the website, and then using that to really craft your story. Um, in the moment, you have uh, two user experience professionals and you have two because of what's happening in that room. So you need one person who's interacting with the participant, who's actually having the conversations, who's watching what they're doing, watching their facial expressions, watching the website. You have another person who is logging that, okay, recording that so the client doesn't have to do it later, who's recording what happens in the session as well as observing the user. You know, a lot of times people make the mistake in assuming that you know usability is listening to what people say 
uh, that is never the case. <laughs> never the case. Um, sometimes people, there are people who are able to articulate exactly what happened and their experience and their feelings about it. Other people will go through a session that is just absolutely miserable to watch, um, miserable for them to go through and walk away and say it was fine. So it's very important to not only you know, gather and listen to what people say, but also watch and observe those experiences. And you get that opportunity in moderated testing. So moderated testing is going to be good for you when you need um, in-depth research into your website, okay? This isn't picking out pieces. This is let's get down to what's going on. Let's really understand the full customer experience. Let's figure out if there's how different parts of the website affect uh, the ability to understand and to comprehend you know, what the website is selling, um, how is messaging affecting, com affecting conversion. Well, let's get in there and let's look at all of that, okay? Um, moderated testing is also best when you want somebody to manage the process. I'm not going to lie and say that, you know, research, any type of user-centered research is just going to be like, you know, turning on the light switch. It's never that easy. Um, there are some pieces, there are some moving pieces that go into it, regardless if it's moderated or unmoderated testing. Um, the benefit with moderated testing, though, is that you can hire a firm to do that for you. You know, this, these are our objectives, this is what we want to do. They take care of everything after that. Um, and for people who have a lot on their plate, that's really a nice benefit to have. And then lastly, when you're looking for a usability partner, um, not only someone who can create those test plans for you, uh, who can analyze the sessions, but most importantly, having a third party who can speak to your stakeholders on behalf of the actual end user. Okay? Um, a lot of times when we've seen it from our clients, they take some of the research that they get from these other services and they're able to manipulate it, you know, and make it say what they want it to say. But at the end of the day, with an unmoderated or with a moderated session, you know, what the user says is what they say, okay? And when a usability professional presents that, you're going to hear the voice of the user and not somebody's personal agenda, not um, anybody's biases. It's just this is what happened. They report on what happens, okay? So that is it for uh, what we wanted to do is pull out the higher level, the bigger questions, the questions that we hear most often. But if there are any other questions that I can take today to answer any specific needs that you have, feel free to use your webinar control panel and send those in to me. Okay, so let's see. Um, looks like several of you have had the same question. How often or how regularly would you recommend moderated testing? Um, so moderated testing, I have clients that I recommend would test at least once a year. Um, I would say even if you're doing unmoderated testing to kind of take care of some of the lighter issues that you have, I would say that at the very least um, for a moderated full usability session, you want to get into your website and look at it at least once a year, okay? Um, definitely anytime you want to do a web design, if you're looking for um, information on uh, wireframes, you want to use usability testing, um, and then in conjunction with different types of other offerings, like maybe a persona or you have some web analytics and you just really want to have a conversation before you go up and invest a lot in design work. So at any of those stages would be a perfect opportunity for moderated usability and testing. I would say at the very least though, a year, once a year. Okay. So if you have any other additional questions, again, my name is Adrian Guillory, and I can be reached at LinkedIn. Um, you can also send any additional questions you have um, to um, a salesperson. Uh, you can give us a call or go to our website at usabilitysciences.com, and we'll be glad to help you with anything that we can. Thank you.